What is up, people? Van from the Vaniverse Gaming Channel here, bringing another video on Solasta Crown of the Magister. Today's video is going to be my review of their third and final DLC called The Palace of Ice that just released here on May 25th, 2023. Before I get into the review, I do want to thank Tactical Adventures for sponsoring this video. I will note that I was going to make this video anyways, whether they sponsored it or not, and their sponsorship had no effect on my review of the DLC. So now with all that said, let's get into the review. So I want to break up this review into several sections. The first section is going to cover what is the Palace of Ice DLC. Then we'll get a little bit into the gameplay. Then we'll get into the com combat. Then we'll kind of talk a little bit about the Dungeon Maker, not too much. And then I'll give you my final thoughts of this DLC and what it adds to Slots of Crown the Magister. So first up, let's talk about what is the Palace of Ice DLC. Okay, so what is the Palace of Ice DLC? The Palace of Ice DLC is the third and final DLC to Solas the Crown of the Magister that is a direct continuation of the Crown of the Magister campaign, but instead it takes you to the northern parts of the continent in the Principality of Mazgarth, where the Snow Alliance kind of exists. And what's great about it is, is since it's a direct continuation, they do make the assumption that you've played through the original campaign and you kind of know what happens and how it ends, so I would recommend playing through the original campaign to go into this just from a story standpoint. But ultimately, you can play with brand new characters. So you could just say, hey, you know what? I'm going to select my campaign, go to Palace of Ice, and just start with 10 characters or four new characters. And they all get leveled up to 10. Or I can import a character from my previous run. So what I chose to do was import, load my characters from my previous Crown of the Magister run, delete off three of them, and then create three new characters. And the reason I wanted to do that was because along with the Palace of Ice DLC, they came out with two new ancestries, which is the Gnome and the Tiefling. And I wanted to play a Tiefling and a Gnome because I never played one before. And then also I wanted to incorporate another Snow Dwarf because they also added some environmental effects in the Palace of Ice DLC that a Snow Dwarf just fits perfectly to. And so that's what I ended up doing. So really like the fact that this is a tack on to the previous campaign and then it takes your characters from level 10 to level 16. So it's higher level gameplay, new spells, new new abilities, new everything, which makes this really fun. So the story goes that you are kind of searching for these Sorax. You know, you, you kicked them out of the Principality of Mazgarth, but they haven't disappeared. You shut the gate, but they haven't left. So now you're trying to track them down and you're trying to figure out what's going on because there seems to be some of these things that are happening. P people are acting strange again and you think that maybe Sorax are behind it. So this takes you through a very similar route as the, as the Crown of the Magister where it's very linear for a certain point. But then it opens up into giving you different quest lines to go after different things and different factions in different parts of the map. So this really does a good job of bringing you into different biomes that have different art styles, different environment effects. So for instance, in the north, you're in the snowy mountains of the dwarves. In the uh, west, I believe there's an elven forest there. You also have a part where there's dwarves, but they all live underground. So you're brought down into the sub, you know, Trinian under caverns. And then there's an area where you're on the front lines trying to battle against a, an army from Galavan. So they do a really good job of not making it look all the same. You know, I think in the in the original base campaign, there were a couple zones that were different. They did a decent job with in the um, Lost Valley DLC. Pretty much everything looked very similar. So I really liked how they did, you know, the multiple biomes, the multiple different environmental effects, the different factions. And they did a really good job of combining what I loved of the Lost Valley DLC with different choices you can make and the simplicity of the linear path of Crown of the Magister. So when you go into this, just understand it's gonna be a higher level campaign. It picks up from the original Crown of the Magister storyline, and then you are also taken through all these different amazing biomes where you start to build different factions and start to figure out different stories. Now, that's kind of what it is. Let's kind of talk about the gameplay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the gameplay. I think the most important part to know about the gameplay is it's higher level gameplay. So you're fighting creatures that range between level 10 and level 16. And in that, you get spells that are level 7th and 8th level. 
So a lot of the times in the previous, you were fighting against creatures that, you know, you could dominate pretty quickly once you got to a certain level. I felt in the Crown of the Magister, I was just unkillable. But I feel in this part, in this DLC, when you're competing against other creatures that have some of these really strong spells, uh, it did add a level of gameplay that was different to what you've experienced up to this point. Now, the question is, why did we stop at level 16 as the cap for the gameplay? I would say because, you know, if you play 5th edition tabletop, most campaigns don't go past 15 anyways, because once you get to that level, your characters are so powerful that it's really hard to balance a campaign around them. And I think this, the developers did a good job with this DLC to add difficulty in preventing long rests or to spread out the creatures to make it a little bit more challenging and some of the other things which we'll talk about in the combat. But I just wanted to make sure that I covered this gameplay definitely feels different. It was the first time that I actually felt like there were battles where I was dipping into scrolls and, and potions and things that I've never done before because I really thought I was going to die and I needed to start using some things because I ran out of all my other resources. So I think that's a real key part. Another key part to the gameplay that they changed is at higher levels, they've now incorporated plus three weapons, plus three armor. But what's really cool is they've also incorporated legendary. Now, in 5th edition D&D, when you get into the level 15, 16 range, most likely your characters are going to be whipping around legendary items. And instead of being able to craft those legendary items, they've done a good job of just putting them in the quest lines and putting them in the game where, depending on which side quest you do and which creatures you kill, you then unlock these different legendary weapons and armor. So it depends on if you choose to kill something or not kill it. It can change on which legendaries that you pick up, and then you can put them into your, into your character. Now, the crafting also has been changed significantly from a gameplay standpoint. They've drastically reduced the time it takes to craft things, and they did a really good job of putting all of the stuff you need to make items on the vendors to make them more accessible. So in Crown of the Magister, all of the crafting recipes was on one person and all of the primed weapons was on a one person for a faction and basically you really had to struggle to find all the crafting materials that you needed in order to make those weapons and armor in this they've done a very good job of creating a crafting item vendor that has everything that you need that you can just purchase and be able to make the crafted items that you're looking for. Now, if you imported your character from the original campaign, a lot of those crafted items you're already gonna have, and you probably know the recipes, but if you're going from scratch in 10 new, brand new characters, this gives you the ability to unlock all of them without having to quest for it. You can just purchase them all and craft whatever you want. So I really like how they've changed the gameplay from a crafting standpoint on making it quicker, making it a little bit harder so you have to actually have someone who's more proficient in crafting and then giving availability so that you don't have to wait or look around to get that cool crafted item you want. You can just buy everything and make it. So great job there. And the last thing I want to talk about to the gameplay that really is quite a pain in the butt is this whole environmental effect. So in the cold area, they have this new debuff on you where if you're not wearing something that protects you from the cold, that you have a debuff to either it's called frozen or you have one that's called chilled, and it really negatively affects your character. So incorporating boots of the winter, rings of cold resistance, you know, snow dwarves, different armors to help prevent or to give you cold resist is super, super important in this DLC. I also will go, and we can talk more about in combat, I have noticed that a lot of stuff in this DLC uses cold damage on you, so it's not going to harm you to pick up cold resistance. But I really do like how they have added a survivability to the game where if you're not geared correctly it negatively affects your combat prowess which makes a lot of what would sim be probably simple encounters become more difficult because of that additional debuff so that's a little bit about the gameplay and some of the changes that came with the dlc so now i'd like to go into the combat 
All right, so the combat in this DLC, I have to hand it to Tactical Adventures. They did a fantastic job of making it difficult. Now, I will say that there are a lot of fights that feel like they take a very long time. And I think they should because we're talking high-level creatures that have a lot of hit points and a lot of abilities. And so if you're utilizing all your resources right away, the fight will go faster. But they do a good job of making you use up your resources where you can't just magically kill everything with one fireball or do those types of things. Like, honest to God, in, in the crown of the Magister, by the time I hit fireball, that's all I did. Fireball, fireball, fireball. And dang near nothing was re was resistant to fire, so I just killed everything. Well, they knew that people like me would just fireball everything, because that's what we do. And they've made a lot of things in this, creatures that are resistant to fire. Well, that sucks. Okay, well then I'm going to just freeze everything. C cone of cold, you know, frozen sphere. No, nope, they're resistant to cold too. So, from a combat standpoint, the way that they... They put the battlefield where they separate the creatures, the way that they've given resistances to certain creatures, they've added more legendary creatures in, they've added in more creatures that can incapacitate and can stun, they've added in all of these different things with extra attack and wizards that can counter spell and it casts really powerful spells on you like Frozen Sphere, Cone of Cold, Fireball, um, Feeble Mind, all this other stuff. It has really changed the combat to a different level that you have experienced in Salasa Crown of the Magister. I have put over 500 hours into Salasa Crown of the Magister, and there were fights in this that I was like, holy shit, I'm going to die. And granted, I play on the, on the hardest difficulty, but still, it was still like shocking to me how much more difficult some of these fights were and how it drains your resources. Like, they know you're going to be casting 7th, 8th level spells. You're probably going to have access to a whole bunch of 5th and 6th level spells. So your ability to do massive damage is off the charts. But if they're not all standing together and they have resistances to half the crap you're doing, well, that changes things a whole heck of a lot. So I really like how they did the combat to account for the power that comes with being levels 10 to 16 and having access to 7th and 8th level spells plus 3 weapons, legendary weapons and it really shows that the people who built this thought it through and I'm just quite impressed with how difficult some of these fights were and I really do believe that it has led to this being probably my favorite DLC solely because of the complexity of how, how tough the fights are I feel like a lot of the battles are also very epic scale, like, you know, you're getting attacked by an army, and they're coming on different fronts, and so you have different places you have to go, and they don't let you rest in between, and so it was just a really pleasant surprise that made me have a super, super ton of fun um, with the combat. So that pretty much covers my thoughts on combat. So I really want to get into, I'll go into the Dungeon Maker a little bit, and then we'll get into kind of my summary of the game. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Dungeon Maker. I personally don't, don't dabble with the Dungeon Maker that much, just due to time. I have played other people's mods that were made with the Dungeon Maker, and it's amazing what you could do with the Dungeon Maker before. With the improvements to the Dungeon Maker now, they've taken what you could do before and just put it to a whole new level. So now you actually can have a world map in the Dungeon Maker and you can link things together, which allows you to almost replicate the Crown of the Magister or the Lost Valley and go back and forth to different areas to do different quest lines. In addition to that, they've built in random events where you can have people stop and travel world map on the way and do things like that. They've also added in the NPC follower system that allows you to bring NPCs with you along on your journey. They added in new characters, new spells, and so they've pretty much made the dungeon maker to the point where if you have, if you're savvy in the program, you can pretty much replicate what they've done 
with the the main campaign and with Solasta's Palace of Ice DLC. And I'll be quite honest, there are some mods out there where the gameplay is super fun that I would highly recommend, and I'll probably make a video on them for everybody who wants to try out some of the mods who just love Solasta and the gameplay and want to try out some more fan content that is really great. So really like what they did there. So let's kind of get to my final thoughts and we'll wrap up this video. Okay, so after putting in the time, I would say Solasta's Palace of the Ice DLC would be the piece de la resistance of Solasta. They've taken everything they've learned from when they started and taken all the money that they have gotten in from the different DLCs and continued to approve upon the game. And now if you were first coming into Solasta today, never played it, I mean, you're talking 25 hours of content on this DLC, probably another 15 to 20 with Lost Valley, and probably close to 40 with the main one. So depending on how often you play through, I mean, if you just play the main campaign and the Palace of Ice, that alone is going to be 65 hours or so of gameplay. And so I really think that this is the epitome of what this game could have looked like from the beginning if they had the money and it leads me to be super excited with what other projects they have coming out now that they've kind of tied the bow on Solasta. In addition, I would like to say that, you know, the the visual and the audio sounds and like the spell effects have just been increased. So visually the different biomes are super fun. The gameplay is fun because of all the different aspects they put enough into it with legendary gear and all that to make it a really fun experience so for anyone who likes fifth edition DD and they're looking for a game that is identical to the combat play style of a board you know you know actions bonus actions all of that this is an amazing example replica or you know digital version of tabletop this is not where this fails and they did not improve it with the uh Solas, the palace of ice dlc is this is not a story driven game the story is okay the ability to interact with npcs is terrible the the dialogue is very few and far between you don't have a lot of option options and a lot of your options and decisions don't really change a lot of things the voices, there's only three voices for males and three voices for females, and one of the voices is the exact same. So it is kind of weird that you have all these different race options, but they all have the same voice. And so really don't like that, but they did mention they just didn't have the budget to voice act a lot of this stuff and to increase voices, because then they'd have to go through on every interaction in the entire game to add a new voice, and hopefully they'll change that. Also... The character visual models are terrible. And so that is where they still haven't improved. They haven't improved the visual. They haven't improved the like the voice and the immersion of it. They haven't improved the RP of it. But that's okay because that's not what this game was designed to do. This game was designed to be a replica of combat and how a D&D 5th edition game should play. And if you're looking for the ability to learn 5th edition tabletop D&D... There is no better way to do that than to play Solasta because it is literally an exact copy of the game. In a month, two months, in August, Baldur's Gate 3 is coming out, and that's the game that you're going to get to play out your fantasy of RP and do whatever the heck you want and drive the story and change people's opinions of you based on your actions, and that's great. One is for one type of person, one is for the other, and there's no reason why you have to play one or the other. So highly recommend this game, highly recommend dropping the money on the Palace of Ice DLC. And if you've never played Solasta before, na there is no better time than now to jump into the game. You got 65 hours worth of content, probably more if you decide to pick up the Lost Valley DLC. And honestly, the cost of the Inner Strength, Lost Valley, and uh, Palace of Ice DLC with the base game... Most likely there'll be some kind of deal or bundle where it's probably going to be about 50 bucks, And it is worth every penny if you love tabletop games or you love tactical RPGs like I do. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'm going to bring out tons of content on Solasta. So just make sure to go ahead and subscribe. Give this a like if you liked it. 
and stay tuned to all my videos. This is Van from the Vanniverse Gaming Channel. Thanks for watching. Cheers and peace out.